This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining. Uh, I'll have uh, Dr. Smith introduce our uh, speaker this morning. This morning, uh, our speaker is uh, Dr. Lisa Van Wagner, who uh, did her medical school at University of Virginia and the remainder of her training at uh, Northwestern uh, in Chicago. Uh, Lisa is a hepatologist uh, and um, she uh, does quite a bit of research, uh, uh, is an expert in uh, dealing with databases and, and looking at predictive models. Uh, and she had given a talk previously this year to the transplant center uh, related uh, to um, heart evaluation and heart disease in patients with liver disease. And I thought it would be a, just a very good talk for, uh, for our group. Um, it, it's interesting as we look at patients who have uh, different physiologies, such as the patients with cirrhosis, how that can uh, impact um, our evaluation, our testing, and, and, and how we need to, to look at that, as well as this very large group of, of patients who are developing fatty liver disease and how we deal with them. For those who don't know, Emory has one of the largest uh, liver transplant programs in the country, uh, consistently doing over 100 liver transplants a year. So this is a population that, uh, that we see um, very commonly on, on Clifton Road in, in, uh, in our cardiac consultation. So I'll, I'll turn it over to, to Lisa. Lisa, we appreciate you uh, uh, being with us this morning. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Smith, for um, inviting me. I appreciate everyone signing in this morning um, to listen to um, what I um, hope is, is an interesting topic for you. Um, and uh, what we're going to do over the next 40 minutes or so is I want to discuss the impact of cardiovascular disease and its risk factors on liver transplant outcomes. Um, I'll summarize a little bit of the current guidance recommendations for detection of cardiac risk on the candidate side. And then in the very last portion of the talk, I'll talk a little bit about some of the identified major gaps in cardiac care in our liver transplant recipients and identify some of our potential ways that we might be able to reduce cardiac risk in this population. So these are my disclosures. And as uh, was already mentioned, I am not a cardiologist. So I come very humbly before you today speaking from a hepatologist point of view. Um, and I absolutely uh, welcome your, your questions and feedback um, at the end of this uh, discussion. So first off, why are we even talking about this today? And um, as Dr. Smith alluded to, um, this is really an, an increasing problem that we're seeing um, in liver transplantation, such that the prevalence of cardiovascular disease since 2002, which is when the MELD organ allocation system went into play in the U.S., um, has been increasing after liver transplant. This is data from, um, from UNOS, um, which of course, is, as all you, you probably all know, is our mandatory reporting database for all solid organ transplantation in the U.S. And you can see that from 2002, we had a prevalence rate of around 11%, and by 2011, we were upwards closer to 17 or 18%. If, if we were to map this out over the last 10 years, um, we are actually closer to about 21 or 22% in terms of cardiac-related mortality within the first um, year after transplant, such that if you look at all causes of death within the first 30 days after transplant, cardiovascular disease is now the leading cause of early mortality, accounting for about 40% of early deaths in this first bar. It has now surpassed infection and graft failure as the leading in, um, cause of early mortality. If we translate this into an estimated cardiovascular disease mortality rate, it's about 1.2% of all comers. Um, and just to sort of put this number in perspective, right, if you compare it to a, you know, other GI procedures, even a cholecystectomy, the rate is about 0.2% in that population. And then as you are all very well aware, in high cardiac risk procedures, such as the cabbage, um, the rate is uh, reported up to about 1.7%. So liver transplantation is a very high cardiac risk procedure. So why is this? Well, a lot happens in the operating room. Um, and for those who have spent any time um, you know, in a, a liver transplant surgery or who have you know, worked with um, uh, the liver transplant population or anesthesia, um, you know that there's a ton of acute changes in preload and hemodynamic stress that happens. These patients often have massive transfusion requirements as a result of that and all the citrated blood products that happen. Um, you can um, end up with severe hypocalcemia induced um, uh, irregularities that can lead to arrhythmia the solution that we use um, in order to preserve the organ graft itself is a potassium bath. And so um, when we unclamp that IVC and we reperfuse that graft, um, you can get huge you know, surges 
as well um, in potassium that can lead to acute arrhythmic changes that of course can lead to acute cardiac arrest. In addition to that, there's an entity known in the operating room as post-reperfusion syndrome, which is um, often directly related in that you know, post-reperfusion stage where you see an acute drop in cardiac output that can happen um, um, right during that reperfusion stage of the liver transplantation. And then in addition to that, all the catecholamine surges that happen in these surgeries, these patients are as you know, we've seen patients with end-stage liver disease. They are, um, you know, they have incredibly normal, you know, low um, SVR. They often require a lot of presser support. Um, so there's exogenous catecholamines that we are giving these patients in the operating room, and then of course um, endogenous catecholamines that come with the stress of surgery. And then this is an incredibly prolonged surgical time. These procedures can take upwards to um, as long as 12 hours, especially in um, donation after cardiac death donor organs um, or living donor operations, um, which can really have prolonged surgical time. So all these things in concert really lead to a lot of high, very immediate um, cardiac risk and perioperative risk. So the events that are actually happening in this patient population, if we look at large databases, um, uh, updated data within the past 10 years, this is a, a paper that we published in AJT a couple of years ago where we merged the UNOS data, which does not capture any sort of cardiovascular you know, specific event outcome in it on the liver transplant side. And we merged it with University Health System Consortium now called the Visient database, which um, and Emory is also a participant of, many of the large health systems are, um, where it's you know billing code data, ICD-9 uh, and 10 code data um, that tells us about rehospitalizations um, and event uh, rates that can be estimated from that for patients who have been transplanted uh, with a liver. So we had about almost 33,000 liver transplant recipients over about a 10 year period. The overall 30 day cardiac event, cardiovascular event rate was about 11%. Um, I will give the caveat in this series, we did include a thromboembolism as one of the cardiac events, but if you remove that, the event rate is still about 10%. And you can see that most of the events here, right, are non ischemic in origin. They're predominantly um, arrhythmic events, 43% uh, prevalence of, of atrial fibrillation among all, all comers, heart failure, about uh, one in four patients who had an event had a heart failure um, event um, with a much smaller proportion of, of myocardial infarction and, and a smaller proportion of stroke risk. This has been reproduced in other data sets. This is data from the nationwide inpatient sample. Um, these are patients who had a history of liver transplantation and then they just looked at readmission data. And what you can see in terms of temporal trends is that over the past you know, 15 years or so that we're seeing a rise in again, uh, admissions for dysrhythmias and heart failure and a excuse me, decrease in admissions for stroke and, and a slight decrease, it's kind of hard to tell on this bottom line, um, but for MI, previously about 10%, again, now down closer to that 7% number that I showed you before. So again, I often get this question, you know, I'm sort of, this is an interesting niche. I don't tend to think about liver transplantation and cardiac risk. I think about it with my kidney patients. I, of course, think about it with my heart patients. Um, and so uh, again, not only what happens in the OR that leads to high perioperative risk, but these patients are coming to the, literally coming for evaluation and coming to the table with a much larger pre-transplant cardiac risk burden than we've ever seen before. Um, so if you look at the prevalence of just say metabolic syndrome by solid organ type, you can see that the prevalence across the board, depending on the solid organ that's being transplanted ranges anywhere from about 15% to about 30%. And liver transplant recipients shown in the light purple here um, for pre-transplant risk have about the same risk of having prevalent metabolic syndrome as your heart or kidneys. But what's really interesting is that if you look post-transplant in terms of prevalence within a five-year period, that it's the liver transplant population that actually has the highest burden of metabolic syndrome prevalence, upwards of about 60% of patients will have metabolic syndrome criteria um, by the time they get to be five years out from transplant. And if we look specifically at the risk factor burden pre and post transplant in this population, this is just data from our own center here at Northwestern. Um, it's been shown in other series as well. And you can see that one of the main drivers is the prevalence of hypertension, um, which you know often right is pre-existing hypertension that is then unmasked when the patient has normal physiology reestablished when they get their new liver graft, um, but also de novo hypertension such that 92% of liver transplant recipients will meet a diagnosis uh, for a criteria for hypertension Attention, and that's using our old definition of that threshold of 140 over 90, not even considering um, the new proposals from, from AHA. CKD, of course, is a huge issue in this population, um, and then dyslipidemia, and then almost one in over one in two patients will have a, a, a either new onset or worsening of pre-existing diabetes within five years after transplant. 
So in addition to all these uh, traditional risk factors that I mentioned, other things that are becoming very uh, prevalent in this population, and there's more new data within the last five years, is the role of low, you know, not just low physical activity, but the frail phenotype and frailty in this population. Obviously, chronic end-stage liver disease leads to a lot of cardiovascular deconditioning over time, um, and that uh, together can obviously lead to um, you know, more vulnerable myocardium that can be unmasked with the stress of liver transplant surgery. Uh, Dr. Smith mentioned, and I'll talk a little bit specifically um, about the role of NASH, which is now, um, as many of you know, um, the leading indication uh, for listing for liver transplantation, and is the second leading indication for actual transplant in the U.S., the leading indication among women, second in men, alcohol is still number one. Um, you add this stuff, there's been a, a rise in literature, we'll talk a little bit about this later, about the entity of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, which of course is um, subclinical changes um, in vulnerable myocardium um, that are detected in the absence of known structural heart disease that is the result of longstanding sort of end-stage liver disease physiology. There's also been a lot of nice translational work um, as well as some basic science work showing that uh, there's increased oxidative stress in this population, um, increased inflammatory pathways, endothelial dysfunction, and then really all these things in concert over time lead to increased risk of thrombosis, um, myocardial remodeling dysfunction, microvascular dysfunction, not just epicardial disease, um, as well as an increased prevalence of uh, coronary artery calcification as well as unstable plaque. So you add all these things, right, to the hemodynamic stress of liver transplant that we talked about, and then just to put the icing on the cake, we give them, you know, immunosuppression that has high cardiac risk, um, you know, for um, de novo um, metabolic syndrome components like diabetes and hypertension and other things that happen with longstanding calcineurin inhibitor use. And it's really not surprising that we've seen such a rise um, in the prevalence of uh, cardiovascular disease in this patient population. So when I'm thinking about this, and again, from a hepatologist standpoint, thinking about uh, risk factors and um, um, how we might wanna think about um, evaluating a patient uh, for risk for cardiac events, I tend to bucket them in my head into the things that are potentially uh, modifiable, non-modifiable, and then those things that I think are interesting that are really potentially more specific to the liver transplant population. And I'm not gonna go over all of these in details. We've talked about many of them already, um, but just to highlight a couple of the transplant-related factors, I mentioned again this, um, idea of that there are donor risk factors that have been looked at specifically over the past five to 10 years, things like donation after cardiac death, which again leads to this prolongation in cold ischemia time of the organ graft, um, which can you know, uh, potentially from a pathophysiologic standpoint lead to increased release of, of endogenous um, catecholamines and um, potassium baths and other things that can lead to increased cardiac risk, prolonged surgical time, um, other um, risks for anesthesia. Donor BMI in and of itself has also been shown to be a risk factor for uh, cardiac events, um, both in the short term and the long term. And some of that may be related uh, to worsening risk for de novo, a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or NASH. Um, and then of course, you know, our choice of immunosuppression protocol um, and uh, how sick the patient is going into transfer from a cardiopulmonary standpoint often can be uh, coexisting and related to the severity of their MELD score. Um, and then other markers of just, you know, cardiopulmonary health, such as, you know, patients who are on a ventilator in the ICU before they go into surgery, obviously are at higher cardiopulmonary risk. And then patients who have a history of underlying, you know, thrombosis or thromboembolism, such as portal vein thrombosis um, or other types of uh, thrombotic risk factors are also um, increased risk for cardiac events. So again, when we're talking about um, evaluation and talking about risk stratification in this population, I think it's important to think about what we're trying to risk stratify. And of course, historically, um, you know, oftentimes, again, as the transplant team, when we're calling you as cardiology, um, we tend to all very much focus on that immediate perioperative risk. And we've talked about what that event those events tend to look like, right? Those are acute decreases in cardiac output. We're asking you to comment on their my overall myocardial function. What's their cardiac arrest risk? What's their chance of having a massive ventricular arrhythmia? You know, embolic events, those types of things. Um, but then, you know, we obviously we care about what's going to happen if they once we get them through the operating room, and you know, once our anesthesia colleagues, you know, work their magic and get them through that surgery. This, the risk shifts and we start to see that the leading event, as I showed you before, really becomes heart failure, more atrial arrhythmias, 
stroke starts to, to come up into a more prevalent position, though it's predominantly hemorrhagic stroke in the first 90 days after transplant, and you start to see an uptick um, in MI risk, but this really doesn't become more prominent in terms of risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease until we get out of that early postoperative period and beyond 90 days after transplant. And honestly, if you look at the data, it's really beyond that one year mark that we start to see the um, increased risk in ASCVD for all the reasons that I mentioned to you before. So that's some of the background in terms of the epidemiology and sort of what do we know about the disease burden, the timeline of events. But the next question is sort of, well, what are we actually doing as a community in order to assess cardiac risk? And this is a survey that's uh, gonna be presented um, at the American Transplant Congress this year and um, that we just submitted for publication where we just sent a survey out and some of you may have answered it, so thank you if you did. Um, but we asked 100, there's 117 transplant programs in the US about their cardiac risk protocols. 52% response rate, all 11 UNOS regions were represented. And we just asked number one, do you have a written protocol for cardiac risk assessment in this population? And the good news is 72% of programs did. Sort of surprising that it's not 100% of programs, but 72% of us have a protocol. Um, and a couple of things um, that I think are interesting to highlight. Number one, if you look at our practice guidance, both from the AHA and a, um, uh, ACC, as well as the American Society of Transplantation and the ASLD, all of the guidelines do recommend that either you know, a dedicated cardiologist or dedicated cardiology team be used um, to um, help risk stratify this population because it is such a unique population. And as we'll talk about, many of the typical tests that we use for risk stratification in non-cardiac um, surgery don't perform the same or don't necessarily apply in this population. But only 59% of us were actually using a dedicated cardiology team um, in risk stratification. And in addition to that, only 50% of programs who used a dedicated team actually involved that dedicated team or dedicated cardiologist in the selection criteria meeting or the discussion about eligibility um, with anesthesia and with surgery and with hepatology um, and the multidisciplinary team. We were a little better on the anesthesia side. 70% of us used a dedicated anesthesiologist or anesthesia team, and the majority of those were involved in selection meeting. So some of you um, who work in this area or who called to consult on these patients or if there's any you know, fellows or trainees on the line, um, you either love to see these patients or as I hear from most of my cardiology colleagues, they hate these consults. Um, so um, I, you know, I'll say the same thing from the hepatology side. We either love to see uh, your heart, you know, uh, patients who are being evaluated for heart transplant because we're really interested in this area or we absolutely shrink and shy away because it's so difficult to risk stratify this population. Um, so I completely understand. But um, this is a proposed framework that um, I often use and, and I know we tend to use a lot of Northwestern for sort of how we stepwise think about these patients and how we tend to try to talk about them in the selection meeting in terms of their overall cardiac risk. So number one is obviously to what's assess their global risk. And of course, in you know, the general population, there's a, you know, numerous tools that we often use, um, both on you know, the cardiology side, of course, but also the anesthesia side in terms of surgical risk, right? The old revised cardiac risk index calculators, the NISQIP, you know, all the other, you know, the million of them out there um, to actually look at you know, what's sort of the overall event rate, especially for the outcomes that we are being measured against, which in terms of transplant metrics, unfortunately, still in 2021, we are still very much being measured against sort of these one-year transplant outcomes. How do our patients do it one year? And obviously, their rehospitalization rate after transplant. So we care. Um, number two is we want to evaluate for what is the likelihood that they have underlying prevalent cardiac disease. And what I'm going to focus on in this talk today is cardiac risk mitigation. I am not going to have time to talk specifically about um, pulmonary vascular disease risk. I'm not going to talk about portal pulmonary hypertension, which is a fascinating topic um, and, and definitely something that we do screen for in this population. But again, the overall prevalence of detecting it and having it, even though we spend a lot of time worrying about it, is still fairly low. It's only about 6% of patients um, who will actually have portal pulmonary hypertension. So I'm going to focus on CAD risk and heart failure risk. I'm not going to get into too much depth about arrhythmias and valvular heart disease um, because there's just not as much data supporting some of the practice patterns that we do have in that area. Um, there's much more data in the other two areas to, to update today. Of course, we want to treat modifiable risk factors that we identify, and then we want to consider all this um, in terms of what does this mean in the setting of a liver transplant surgery for both you know, the immediate perioperative risk and then, of course, long-term risk and how we might mitigate that. 
And the most important thing, of course, is that this is a multidisciplinary discussion. This is not something that should be thrown on our cardiology colleagues' shoulders uh, to give us the answer and tell us it's all good to go. Um, we obviously, um, as I'm sure those who have been, been involved in this process uh, in, in your listing meetings, there's obviously um, lots of discussions and sometimes differences of opinions and between um, you know um, all the, the different players in the game, surgery and hepatology and anesthesia and, and the cardiac team. And oftentimes we have to involve some of our other subspecialists um, within those different areas to, to help us understand this patient's risk. So in terms of global risk, I, I do just want to bring forth one potential tool that might be helpful to you if you haven't heard about this before. Um, this is something that we developed here at Northwestern um, called the CARL T-score or cardiovascular risk and orthotopic liver transplantation score. And again, this came out of a recognition that um, there, uh, all the you know, non-surgical um, cardiac risk scoring systems that we have, you know, obviously liver transplant patients were not involved um, in the derivation of those scores. When they have been looked at in this population, they perform fairly poorly. We see statistics of about um, 0.6. Um, so we looked at our own transplant experience at Northwestern over about a 10-year period. Um, we looked at over 300 preoperative excuse me, perioperative variables. And these are the ones that, that came out um, in the final models. Um, we did uh, some internal uh, bootstrapping statistical techniques to validate this model. And um, this is a freely available calculator. It's available online. Um, you can download a, a link um, on your mobile phones as well. Um, and it gives you the one year absolute predicted risk. And again, that one year mark for us as a transplant program being a very important thing that we're sort of measured against. Um, and this is a risk of a hospitalization or a death due to a um, cardiac related event. And you can see that the risk ranges from a less than 5% in a very low risk candidate to greater than 45% in high risk candidates. Now, of course, give the caveat to say that this is not meant to make, you know, nobody's one score on this should preclude transplantation. There's been no studies to say, um, you know, whether or not, um, you know, what testing should be done based on a certain score. This is really just to help frame risk and help frame risk discussions. Um, there will be an abstract that's being presented um, at our Digestive Diseases Week this year. This has um, been validated at um, University of Cincinnati, validated it in their population. Um, uh, see statistic um, is around uh, 0.72. Um, and um, Baylor um, Dallas yeah. has also been validating this in their population as well. Well. So I do want to mention um, uh, just uh, one uh, document that uh, recently came out within the last two years uh, from the American Society of Transplantation, which was a nice multidisciplinary effort um, between not only um, hepatology, but also uh, cardiology um, and uh, our nephrology colleagues um, through um, our communities of practice um, within AST. I'm just coming up with some consensus recommendations in terms of absolute contraindications and relative contraindications to uh, proceeding uh, with uh, liver transplantation in this population. Um, and I can tell you on the absolute contraindication side, we had some a pretty good consensus. Um, on the relative contraindication side, there was a lot of discussion. Um, so um, I put this here um, as, as a reference for you. I'm happy to talk about this more, um, but there's definitely a wide variation in practice patterns, especially in terms of um, sort of heart failure severity, um, in terms of you know ejection fraction cutoffs and, and whatnot that, that different centers are comfortable with uh, taking um, for a liver alone transplant, not talking about heart liver uh, consideration. So um, spend just a couple of minutes specifically talking about CAD risk detection in this population, because even though the uh, most perioperative and early cardiac events are non-ischemic in origin, this is really where a the bulk of our data has really lied within the last 15 years or so is in terms of, of this population. So a couple of key principles is number one, that the strongest predictors of obstructive coronary artery disease and liver transplant candidates um, have over and over again been shown that greater than two, you know, traditional cardiovascular risk factors actually does a pretty good job of, of letting us know who's at, at higher risk, risk for obstructive CAD um, with two different caveats in this population. Number one, one is that NASH, um, as Dr. Smith mentioned in the introduction, um, has multiple, multiple, multiple papers now um, have shown that this population above and beyond traditional factors has an increased risk of having increased cardiac mortality and increased risk of hospitalization for cardiac events, um, both from a um, ASCVD side, you know, in pertinent to obstructive coronary disease, um, but also a heart failure risk. 
And then I just want to mention renal dysfunction because if you know we think about this in the general population, we're often using you know a creatinine cutoff or you know a certain stage of CKD uh, to define a renal dysfunction um, as a CAD uh, risk equivalent in this population. But the important thing is in patients with end stage liver disease who are often very frail, they have low muscle mass, um, you know creatinine and our typical measures of estimating um, uh, GFR in this population grossly underestimate renal dysfunction in patients with end stage liver disease. So this is one of those unique things that much milder renal dysfunction in patients with liver um, end stage liver disease um, are um, uh, risk factors for um, worsening um, the likelihood of having obstructive coronary artery disease. And then the other key principle is that the severity or extent of CAD does not impact post-liver transplant survival if these patients are appropriately revascularized prior to transplant. So uh, just as one example paper that I think was um, nice that was published uh, within the last three years here, just looking at um, NASH as a unique risk factor for uh, significant CAD. And this is the experience out of the VCU group they looked um, specifically here um, at different etiology uh, for uh, end-stage liver disease, hepatitis C versus NASH versus alcohol. The white bars are showing you patients who have no coronary artery disease, and then as the shading goes up, um, it's demonstrating um, worsening obstructive disease. And just a couple of uh, key take-home points here. Uh, if you look at the NASH bar, you can see that one in two NASH candidates had some level of CAD. 30% of those um, had uh, obstructive uh, coronary disease as shown in the black, um, and 10, oh, sorry, 30% uh, had obstructive coronary artery disease um, shown in these shaded bars, and then 10% uh, uh, had triple vessel disease shown in the black. And NASH was the strongest adjusted independent predictor of significant CAD, uh, increasing the odds of having obstructive uh, CAD of threefold. And I will say that um, at VCU, the reason this is such a nice study is that they do choose um, a predominantly invasive angiography strategy for risk stratification in their population. So this was all um, CAD that was diagnosed on invasive angiography. So again, getting back to sort of what are centers doing, you know, we ask centers, what are you doing to assess you know, cardiac risk and, and what is your sort of decision-based approach for pursuing additional testing in this population? <laughs> so number one is that most of us actually, 92% are not using an everybody gets an invasive angiography approach. Only 7% of project programs were doing that. 92% of us use risk-based decision-making to determine what sort of tests we're gonna order next. Most of us, you know, obviously are using all the traditional risk factors um, that, you know, I mentioned before that are associated uh, with underlying obstructive disease. I will say that what age threshold we're all choosing is widely variable. Um, the age range ranges anywhere from as low as 30 um, to as high as around 65 uh, in terms of what we consider to be high risk um, for underlying CAD. But I think what's interesting here is that despite the large body of literature that is out there on the influence of NASH in terms of CAD risk, only 56% of us consider NASH uh, to be an additional risk factor in terms of how we think about testing. And then only 43% of us in the liver world seem to think that sex um, is an important risk modifier for underlying CAD despite the evidence that we have in the general population. So obviously there's a lot of unanswered questions. You know, We don't know how many and which risk factors really provide optimal risk stratification in this population um, and which ones actually link most importantly to um, cardiac outcomes, actually hard cardiovascular outcomes, not just detectable um, CAD. So of course, I don't have to tell this group um, about you know, needing to think about what you're looking for when you're, before you're ordering a test, but oftentimes when I'm talking to our um, uh, you know, general sort of multidisciplinary transplant group, we have to remind them that you know, not all um, risk stratification and imaging tests are the same. And so um, obviously, you know, we all would love to put all these patients on a treadmill and exercise them to actually look at their cardiopulmonary reserve. But for anyone, of course, who's seen a patient with end-stage cirrhosis and a MELD greater than 30, 99.9% um, .9 of these patients are going to be unable uh, to, to um, tolerate any sort of exercise testing. So traditionally and historically, we focused a lot on cardiac wall motion imaging and wall motion imaging abnormalities in this population. Um, but of course, you know, in the last five to 10 years, we've had huge, you know, um, data that in the general population that has shown um, that, you know, non-invasive anatomic assessment of CAD um, is um, taking you know, huge precedence in risk stratification in non-cardiac surgeries. And then obviously the role of abnormal coronary flow, not just for epicardial disease, but also microvascular coronary disease. So again, in terms of non-invasive stress imaging and sort of what we've done historically, um, the, 
predominantly we've looked at dobutamine stress echocardiography and in the next slide, I'll show you a little bit on what that data has shown in terms of its test performance characteristics. But the thing to think about in no matter what type of non-invasive stress imaging that you're choosing in this patient population is that the physiology of end-stage liver disease often makes these tests very unreliable. Again, these patients have limited functional capacity, but they also have blunted chronotropy and they have chronic vasodilation. So they oftentimes, right, they don't mount an appropriate heart rate response to stressors, whether that stressor is exercise or whether that stressor is a pharmacologic agent. So if we look at stress wall motion imaging, uh, um, like I said, um, most of our uh, body of literature, and there has now been over 50 studies that have looked at DSC um, compared, you know, looking at DSC in relation to um, cardiac outcomes and also DSC um, correlates uh, with invasive angiography as the gold standard. And the sensitivity of DSC in this population for all comers is terrible. It's 13 to 22%. Yet this is still what is sitting in our guidelines, um, which unfortunately now are approaching 10 years old. The negative predictive value in the right population is a little bit better. It's got about an intermediate and negative predictive value between 75 to 80%. So in a low risk person who you have a low pretest probability for underlying obstructive CAD, perhaps DSC might be appropriate. But as an all comer screening test for CAD risk, um, it's not a great test. Um, vasodilator testing um, is about the same, um, has, you know, depending on the series that you look at, the sensitivity is anywhere from 35 to 37%. Um, there have been a few studies now looking at the role of stress cardiac MR. There's been studies that have looked at can we do MR at the same time as we do, you know, um, sort of a one-stop shop HCC screening and cardiac um, uh, risk screening for both CAD um, and um, uh, structural abnormalities. Um, but the sensitivity is still only about 50% in this population. And of course, it's very expensive. It's very time consuming. So not a great one-size-fits-all screening test. So the negative predictive value is excellent. In terms of abnormal coronary flow, there has been a lot of focus over the last you know, 15 years on potentially using SPECT imaging as opposed to DSC in this population, um, but it's actually worse than DSC. Sensitivity is a little bit superior, but the negative predictive value is terrible, um, again, because of the chronic vasodilation state in this, in this patient population. So if you get a positive test, actually the specificity of SPECT is actually quite good. It's about 98, 99%, um, but a negative test should not make you feel better in this population. I think what's more interesting in terms of new data that's coming out in terms of uh, functional imaging is the role of potentially cardiac pet, uh, pet testing and PET CT, um, depending obviously on, on what your institution um, has strengthened. And, and I think uh, when I gave this talk before, uh, Dr. Smith was mentioning then that you, you do have access to, to PET CT and then you are a pet center, which is great. I'll say at Northwestern, we tend to be at a cardiac MR center. And um, so that's what we uh, tend to use in terms of more advanced imaging when we, when we get to that point. Um, but there's been a couple studies now that have been published in the liver transplant population um, showing great sensitivity and negative predictive value, but again, requires centers who have specific expertise in this area in order to perform it. So it's sort of a hard test to recommend across the board for all centers at this point. Um, and then I think, you know, a very hot topic, as you are all very well aware, is of course, you know, looking um, at um, fractional flow reserve on uh, CT imaging. Um, but again, for, you know, again, all the reasons that we talked about in terms of the chronic vasodilatory uh, state and flow reserve and assessing flow reserve in this population that we actually don't even know how FFR um, compared to the general population actually performs in liver transplant patients or patients with cirrhosis in general. Um, so I've just given you that this is the data obviously from the general population. There has not been um, good published studies with good controlled data to look at how this actually performs in liver transplant candidates um, at all. So the bottom line is that given the overall low sensitivity and positive predictive value of non-invasive stress testing in these patients, that really coronary angiography, um, either invasive or non-invasive, uh, remains the criterion standard for detection of CAD. So in terms of anatomic imaging tests for CAD in this population, um, the coronary CT angiography has you know, taken a huge surge in, um, in patients with end-stage liver disease, and it's probably one of the most ideal tests to consider. Um, these are um, estimates uh, in the uh, general population um, uh, without you know, CAC score with a sensitivity and negative predictive value anywhere from 90 to 100%. Um, and again, you know, uh, you are probably all very aware of this, but I think for many of, of your colleagues who you might be suggesting 
a famous text too. Um, it, it might be news to them that the nephrotoxicity with CT angiography um, is much lower than invasive angiography. And so um, I think sometimes it takes a, you know, you needing to educate us a little bit um, about the advancements that have happened within your field um, so that we can better understand um, the wide range um, and, the, and, the, and promise of, of tests like this as opposed to moving straight to invasive angiography, which oftentimes some of our surgical colleagues want to push for. So just a word on invasive angiography in terms of its safety in liver transplant candidates. I think this is another area where the data has really um, advanced over the last 10 years. Obviously, if you look at the older series, um, which predominantly were only using femoral approaches, um, the uh, post-procedure transfusion rate was quite high, almost 50% in some of the theories that were reported um, in these patients, despite platelet counts that were well above 50,000 and INRs that were you know, around you know, 1.5 or so. If you look at the newer series that have been published within the last couple of years, predominantly using a radial approach as long as it's feasible from an anatomic standpoint, we've really seen huge decline in our post-procedure transfusion rates as well as our vascular complication rates as well. So overall, this is pretty comparable, um, slightly increased risk compared to the general population, um, but definitely not prohibitive um, for performing this when there is a good indication to do invasive angiography. Now, in terms of criteria for revascularization, the difference, of course, in liver transplantation is that um, it, because we have a difficult time assessing what is you know, truly functional, that if you have severe obstructive CAD um, and the, given the risks and all the hemodynamic changes in a liver transplant operation, we really do need to consider revascularization if the burden would prohibit transplant in an otherwise appropriate surgical candidate. Because again, remember this is a, you know, a life or death operation. They're either going to get offered a, a liver transplant and potentially survive with revascularization, or they're going to die on the wait list if we choose not to revascularize because we will not take them to the OR um, if they have severe obstructive CAD. There's no specific recommendations on how lesions should be managed at this point. There's no great data other than for me to say that there is insufficient evidence for some of the things that we tend to use in the general population. Like I mentioned before, um, the role of FFR, IFR, and how those actually perform in this population to guide the decision to revascularize um, is really unknown. There have been some studies, you know, whether or not intravascular ultrasound or optical um, uh, conference could potentially play a role in this population. If there's any interventional cardiac cardiologists on here, I'd love to hear your opinions or, or experience in that, um, but no great data to date. And I think the most important thing, um, and uh, what I, I think I really just want to have the take home point here is that the most important thing is that there needs to be a multidisciplinary discussion before we send somebody to the cath lab for revascularization, um, because obviously we are committing these patients um, to dual antiplatelet therapy for a certain duration of time. There are risk benefit discussions that we need to talk about, and we'll talk about um, adapt uh, risk in the next slide, um, and that um, really should be the last thing that we do in the evaluation process. Because you know, if we weren't going to otherwise revascularize somebody, we shouldn't, you know do PCI or, or do other types of revascularization and then decide that they're not a transplant candidate for some other reason. And now we've you know, committed them to something they have a massive bleed or they end up with nephrotoxicity or Lord knows what else. Um, um, so we, we need to make sure we talk about this before, they, before we send them. So if the CAD is not functional, does it matter? Um, this was a nice study um, in all living donor transplant recipients out of Asia. Um, that looked at patients who had two or three vessel um, potentially obstructive CAD that actually wasn't intervened then in the living donor population. And this was all um, using CT uh, coronary angiography, patients who had um, potentially low CAC sores or, or had stable coronary plaque um, detected on CT angiography. And what they showed in this series, as you can see by the colored lines, is compared to those with normal vessels in the blue, um, those with either one or two vessel disease shown in, in the green or the red um, was associated with high rates of, of post-op myocardial injury. So the type 2 MI rate um, was upwards of about 21% in this population within 30 days of transplant. And when they looked back on those patients who died in 30 days after transplant, 50% of the early mortality was associated with post-op myocardial injury. Um, and they could actually show that having obstructive uh, coronary disease um, uh, non-invasively and CT and geography was the most significant predictor um, uh, for having um, early uh, cardiac related death after transplant. So, um, you know, these are, these are not randomized controlled studies. These are retrospective studies and using available data. There's a lot of factors that go into why somebody went forward with transplant and why somebody else was excluded. Um, but this is, I think, 
using some of the nicer data that we have within the last couple of years um, uh, to support this idea that even um, if we don't see um, functional correlates to obstructive CAD, that potentially um, it is worth having a multidisciplinary discussion about the role of revascularization. So in terms of stent choice in 2021, again, for this group, I don't need to go over the, uh, the data on uh, the duration of dual antiplatelet therapy in this population. Um, but um, again, for you needing to educate us and um, hepatology and the surgical world is, um, you know, many, many people are still very unaware that the, the drug eluting sense, which we used to think of as drug eluting sense as old drug eluting sense are no longer, um, and that pretty much everybody is, is stocking these newer generation stents. Um, and that's really what's being used um, across the board. Um, in our survey, it was the same thing. Everybody's using drug eluting sense in this population. Um, very few people are still using bare metal sense, even though that's still what's in our guidelines to consider in this population. Um, again, this, this group is very well aware. Um, obviously, the standard is, is still six months of dual antiplatelet therapy. If you've got somebody who's a low MELG on the wait list, that's appropriate. Most of these patients are not, however, and they don't often have six months to wait for a transplant. And so three months um, absolutely may be okay in terms of, of shortening that duration. And of course, there is some data potentially to suggest in the general population that in patients with a very high bleeding risk, um, you know, you might be able to get away with even as short of a month. But I would say that that, that is definitely not the standard of care and, and not what most centers are doing at this stand, uh, time point. So most people are still doing a minimum of three months um, and ideally six. So what about the data in terms of safety of dual antiplatelet therapy? This is just one of several studies um, that have been published. This is looking at in a VA population, patients with end-stage liver disease, these were not transplant candidates. Um, and they just looked at a case control study of patients who um, got uh, coronary interventions in the dark orange versus those um, who got medical management um, for their CAD. And of course, you can see not surprisingly that those patients who were in dual antiplatelet therapy had an increased bleeding risk. But um, in terms of statistical significance, that bleeding risk did not become significant until they were greater than uh, one year on DAF therapy. And we already said we're not going to keep them on it for, for longer um, than six months and ideally not longer than 90 days if we can. But the most important thing is that these bleeding events are not variceal bleeds. Okay? So I'll say that again. <laughs> These bleeding events are not variceal bleeds. So I completely understand from the proceduralist standpoint that, that we absolutely worry about massive variceal bleeding in this population, but that's not most of the bleeding that happens. What happens in this patient population in this series and many, many others is peptic ulcer disease or gastrointestinal bleeding um, as a result of, of DAP therapy, just like in the general population. So if these patients were put on an appropriate medical PPI um, for um, protection for peptic ulcer disease, you can see that the adjusted odds ratio for risk of bleeding was significantly reduced. Um, so really, if we appropriately medically manage these patients, they do very well. Um, there's no role for needing to, you know, rescreen them for varices or prophylactically band them or prophylactically tips them or anything else um, prior to proceeding um, with, with dual antiplatelet therapy. So just a word on the role of cabbage in this population. Older series, including those from my own institution, um, were doing cabbage at the time of liver transplant with a fairly high mortality rate, such that I'll say at Northwestern, we stopped for about 10 years and didn't do this for a while. Um, but the nice thing, as you know, is that our ability uh, to successfully perform cabbage in this population has really improved over time. And so um, you can see this is nice data um, from patients who've um, undergone cabbage in the US in 2002 to 2014, um, that we've had a nice decrease in overall mortality from cabbage from about uh, you know, almost 12% in 2002 down to about 7.7% in, in 2014. We don't have good randomized data in terms of you know, cabbage versus PCI. Obviously, the earlier we perform the cabbage in a child A patient, it's going to have a much better outcome than you know, trying to do this in a child C patient without doing it at the time of transplant. It's just not feasible. The patients have way too high of a mortality risk. Um, so combine cabbage plus liver transplanting as an option. We have now started doing this again um, with, with better better um, you know, collaboration between our CT surgeons and our liver transplant team, but obviously it's a huge team approach and it takes a lot of discussion uh, beforehand on, on how this is going to work in the OR and, and, and with anesthesia and, and, and the perioperative and postoperative management of these patients. Um, and then whether or not TIPS has a role in, in especially in child A patients in terms of reducing uh, surgical risk uh, surrounding cabbage in this population is really unknown. 
So just a final word on what centers are actually doing in terms of CAD diagnosis. Most of us are using non-invasive modalities as I showed you based on a risk stratification approach. 80% of us are still using DSD despite the data that I showed you. Um, about 49% of us, almost half, are still using SPAC testing, which I would argue it really has no role in this population at all um, as a screening test. Despite the increase in data on the, um, I think, nice uh, supportive role for the use of CT coronary angiography, only 30% of us are actually doing this, um, and a very small uh, percentage are using stress cardiac MR um, sort of routinely. Um, I think another important point to say is that what we don't have good uh, consensus on as well in this population is when do you reassess risk? We think about this a lot in the kidneys because they're listed for so long, but I will say now with our new um, organ allocation systems uh, here in, in the U.S. and especially patients who are you know, being listed for things like uh, liver cancer who are sitting on the list longer now, um, we really need to be thinking about and talking about when do you reassess their risk in terms of, of, of having um, different intervals, six or 12 months, when we need to be rethinking about risk. And only about half of us have some sort of um, you know, predefined uh, interval in which we're actually thinking about risk reassessment. And only half of us are doing invasive coronary angiography um, as the last test prior to listing here as well. And only 13% of us um, have an a priori plan um, before we send somebody excuse me, to the cath lab as to what we're going to do uh, with what we find when we get in there. So 13% of the of programs actually have that discussion ahead of time. So just a couple of words on cardiomyopathy and heart failure risk evaluation. As I mentioned, this is really the, the leading sort of early 90-day um, complication that happens in this patient population. And just um, want to uh, highlight um, that um, the uh, Cerotic Cardiomyopathy Consortium recently got together about uh, two years ago now um, with um, uh, representatives uh, from cardiology and hepatology, um, those who have a, a research interest in this space, and revised some of the um, diagnostic criteria based on you know, newer echocardiographic guidelines um, from the ASC and, um, and others um, to sort of redefine how we think about this entity so that we can try to move the, the field forward in terms of research in this area from the 2005 um, uh, World Congress of Gastroenterology criteria that were previously published. So um, these criteria are no surprise to those of you who uh, practice in the echocardiography space, but this was a nice paper that just came out actually in December of this year that looked at, you know, how do we think about prevalence of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy if we look at different diagnostic criteria. So of course you got the ASC criteria. This is the 2019 criteria I just showed you, and this is the old 2005 Montreal criteria. So the prevalence of the disease really ranges anywhere from about 28% using the new criteria, upwards of 67% you know, prevalence if you use the Montreal criteria. Um, and then I think the other take home from this slide is that really the driver, no matter what criteria you're using for diagnosis is, is predominantly in terms of diastolic dysfunction and, and much less in terms of systolic dysfunction, which again, given the change in the patient population that we're transplanting, more NASH, more diabetes, older patients, um, not super surprising um, that we're seeing um, you know, higher um, um, risk of, of, of abnormalities and in failing pressures and, and diastolic dysfunction as opposed to overt systolic function, dysfunction in this population. But if you detect cirrhotic cardiomyopathy, does it actually predict post-transplant cardiac outcomes? And again, this is a nice new paper, which was just um, uh, published in February of this year um, by the Mayo Group, 141 of their patients, mean age of 57 years old. Um, they had a cirrhotic cardiomyopathy prevalence of about 35%. Um, and they looked at survivorship free of incident cardiovascular disease post-transplant. And you can see that those with cirrhotic cardiomyopathy um, had a, um, a significantly um, you know, reduced chance of survivorship free from CVD um, as time went on from transplant. They also showed specifically that heart failure risk was the main driver um, for this uh, composite endpoint as well. So, you know, obviously needs to be, be shown in, in other uh, transplant um, uh, centers and populations, but I think goes to support um, that, that incorporating uh, the criteria for cirrhotic cardiomyopathy is potentially an important thing that we should be thinking about or looking at in this patient population. So even though functional um, or stress testing may not be um, the best test to choose for thinking about obstructive coronary disease, it absolutely can play a very important role in understanding vulnerable myocardium in terms of you know, cardiac function and cardiopulmonary function. 
Um, and so, you know, we uh, there's been studies that have looked at potentially the role of the absence of contractile reserve, maybe an early manifestation of cirrhotic cardiomyopathy and diffusing stress echocardiography. Um, so DSC may still play a role um, in assessment um, for underlying CCM, even though it may not play a great role um, for detection of obstructive CAD. These other tests, you know, cardiopulmonary exercise testing, the six minute walk test, cardiac MR, I think there's been a, a lot of nice small single center studies and um, talking about this in a, sort of a research setting. I don't think there's great, you know, any great multi-center data to support routine use of any of these things and just sort of as a one size fits all in all of our patients. Um, other than to just point out that I think there's some nice new data that's coming out in terms of the role of cardiac MR in certain subpopulations and not just the traditional ones we tended to think about like the hemochromatosis patient um, or the patient with bad severe alcohol liver disease in which case we do need to be thinking about underlying cardiomyopathy but really for the role um, in, in this sort of undetectable um, cirrhotic cardiomyopathy population, particularly in NASH, um, that there are a lot of things that we can learn on cardiac MR um, that have been shown now to be um, independent predictors, like the percentage of you know, um, CCV and, and also um, T2 star and some of these other things um, that potentially uh, predict uh, post-transplant heart failure risk. So the jury's still out, um, but I think um, we'll see a lot more in the next couple of years being published in this area. So finally, what is the acceptable cardiovascular risk threshold um, in terms of how much risk are we willing to take? Obviously, this varies very widely from center to center, and it, it, a lot of it's dependent on our own risk experience, our volume of transplants, our team dynamics. What are the things that we can actually modify, and what are, what are our current outcomes, and how much risk can we actually tolerate? So we made it through the liver transplant. And I want to just spend five minutes really quickly talking about, you know, what do we do when we get to the other side? And I think that's been the biggest gap in this space uh, to date is that, you know, in living in the U.S. now, we have, you know, over um, um, 80,000 patients um, who've had, um, you know, solid organ transplantations, and that number continues to rise. We're doing nearly 9,000 liver transplants a year um, in the U.S., and one-year survival rates are, are upwards of 95%. So these patients are living longer, um, which means that they're living with more cardiac and cardiovascular risk. So we looked very specifically at our own data in terms of our own, you know, sort of low hanging fruit adherence to cardiovascular prevention guidelines and liver transplant recipients. And you can see at Northwestern, we're not doing so great. Um, in terms of getting our patient's blood pressures uh, below, you know, target threshold of 140 over 90, um, we're only about 15% of patients are meeting that threshold within the first year after transplant um, and, and sort of metering out at about 30%. Um, our statin prescriptions for primary prevention um, for those with ASCVD risk greater than 10%, it's somewhere between five and 10 percent over time. And then obesity counseling, um, we do pretty well in the first year after transplant. I mean, at least one in three patients seems to be getting some counseling, but it looks like we get tired of telling them that they need to lose weight, um, and that drops down to about 20 percent um, overall uh, long-term after transplant. But the question is, if we do some of these things, does it actually move the needle on outcomes? And so we looked specifically at blood pressure, and we looked at patients who were able to maintain a blood pressure less than 140 over 90 in the first year after transplant versus those who were not, whether it was medications or whether it was their native blood pressure. And you can see those in the gray bar who had blood pressure control to that threshold had a significantly lower um, adjusted uh, risk of having the cardiovascular composite endpoint and had a lower risk of mortality compared to those who did not meet that threshold over time. So if we can potentially address some of these things that we know works in the general population, there doesn't see, there does seem to be data that it also um, potentially could improve long-term outcomes in the liver transplant population. But how do we do this? So we did a survey about a year ago that we asked 130 US physicians, multidisciplinary. So we asked you know, cardiology, we asked nephrology, endocrine, hepatology, surgery, uh, general internal medicine about their perspectives on cardiovascular disease uh, practice guidance. So we took what's out there in the, in the world in terms of general population recommendations, as well as what's uh, transplant specific um, in six domains. So blood pressure control, glucose, you know, CKD risk, and um, eating lipid management, and ask them to rank their importance and accuracy in the liver transplant population. So we all agreed on you know, several things. You know, people shouldn't smoke, we should screen, we should get statins for secondary prevention, we should control blood pressure and diabetes, of course, we should counsel them on lifestyle modification, but there was a lot more disagreement than there was agreement. Nobody knew how long, uh, how frequently we should be screening. Do statins actually have a role for primary prevention in this population? How low should we be targeting blood pressure? And none of us were very confident in our ability to recommend you know, any sort of weight loss therapy, bariatric surgery, or type of diet. 
So then we actually got together some focus groups and we asked transplant uh, uh, patients, we asked their caregivers, and then we asked their multidisciplinary providers and separate focus groups, what are your biggest health concerns after transplant? And the patients and caregivers, you know, really said rejection, immune levels, kidney failure. I just don't think about my heart. I wasn't aware there was a correlation between my liver and heart. You're not worried about the heart at that point. You're worried about living. The transplant provider said the same thing. Liver graft, immunosuppression, prophylaxis, other things like cardiac disease and renal disease, those come much lower down. You always kind of think, all right, if they, the patient, leave and I don't do this, no one else is going to do this. And that is usually immunosuppression and the function of the graft. Everything else could be done by somebody else. So who's responsible for managing cardiovascular disease risk after liver transplant? And we, again, we got some quantitative data from patients who participated, as well as multidisciplinary providers. And we can see that the majority of recipients and caregivers in the yellow and the purple bars, these are you know, specialist care, either by the transplant provider or the cardiologist or the nephrologist that happened to have one. And nearly 100%, you know, some combination really thought it should be their specialist who should be managing their risk and their primary care doctor did not have a role. Whereas the healthcare providers, no matter what specialty, primary care, transplant, or whoever, all thought primary care should really be the people who should be managing um, CVD risk, especially for primary prevention in this population and really only involving specialists um, um, for secondary prevention. So there's a big disconnect between what providers think and what providers think is happening and what patients and caregivers actually prefer. So one of the things that we're trying to do to address this practice gap is um, I have funding from NHLBI. We're um, working on putting together a cardiovascular disease quality improvement and liver transplantation with CVD quilt toolkit um, that unfortunately due to COVID um, had some significant halting in the last year, but it's finally getting back up and running. Things like um, you know uh, PCP education, um, uh, immediate access to the transplant farm pharmacy team utilizing our transplant pharmacists for, you know, statin prescriptions. And, you know, there's been some great data in some of our other solid organ recipients about utilization of the transplant pharmacy team and how we can better implement um, some of these practice guidelines and, and do a better job of managing risk in this population. And I think overall, whether we're talking about liver transplant, kidney transplants, heart transplant, it sort of goes back to this idea of, you know, where, where's transplant medicine going? Um, how are we going to think about sort of reorganizing our delivery of care to this population and our long-term management of this population as all these patients are living longer than they were before? Um, and, and really the, you know, the transplant, you know, subspecialists um, don't have the education training or, or the bandwidth um, to, to manage all these things. And I'm sure you, you know, encounter this uh, same issue as well, um, sort of how do we um, you know, develop a better practice organization around you know, the idea of, of, of a medical home um, and uh, really integrate primary care um, and this idea into care delivery. So just in summary, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality after transplant and event risk really changes over time. ACS is a relatively rare event, but heart failure is not, which is really important to remember when, you know, we're being asked to stratify this population in terms of the types of things that we're looking for. Evaluation of CAD risk should center on a risk-based protocol, and the new criteria for steroidic cardiomyopathy really should be considered in the risk profile of liver transplant candidates based on contemporary data. Control of cardiac risk may decrease mortality and cardiovascular events, and detection and surveillance of these risk factors improves clinical outcomes, but our ability as practitioners to um, effectively do this is very much lacking, and our confidence in doing so is lacking, and so we really require um, you know, some better implementation strategies to better uh, care for this population jointly. So um, there's been a huge body of uh, people who have both mentored and collaborated with me um, on this work and um, they're listed here and, and wanna thank them all, uh, particularly Donald Jones at Northwestern who is my primary mentor and I've been working with for many years now um, who's just been incredibly supportive of this work. Um, these are the funding bodies who have uh, funded this work and I thank you for your time and I look forward to any questions. Thank you, um, Dr. Van Wagner. That was absolutely fantastic. Congratulations for, for really, I've, no, I, I've never heard a gastroenterologist give such an amazing cardiology <laughs> related talk. That's very humbling, thank you. <laughs> so that, that was really, really fantastic. Um, uh, while I'm waiting for questions, because I know uh, as people are thinking about their questions, uh, what is your sort of standard practice at uh, Northwestern? You know, often for people who are waiting on um, 
transplant it, you know, whether it's liver or renal or whatever, you know, there, there are some centers where there's like automatic stress testing that's ordered. Yeah. Um, what, what are you guys doing there? Yeah. I wish we could say that we are doing better than everyone else. And um, we have, we are revamping our protocol right now, um, but we do still have a um, audit. There still has been an automatic testing protocol where people were still getting, everybody was getting ordered for a DSC um, and actually it become, people have been so used to it that most of our cardiology colleagues were, you know, sort of refusing to see patients until they had the DSC in hand, their EKG in hand and some of those things. So we've recently had a lot of meetings over the past six months to a year, um, sort of redoing that so that we are based on a risk protocol. Now there, there is, you know, based on risk, there will be a decision on who gets pre-testing before they see cardiology. And then of course, in the high risk candidates, they should will see cardiology first before the decision on further testing is made um, so that the appropriate test is ordered for the appropriate patient as opposed to this sort of one size fits all approach, which we know is not cost effective, nor is it a benefit to the patient. Yeah, I think the, you know, the routine stress testing, I mean, I, I feel like a lot of places have that in place, you know, yeah. and, um, um, uh, Dr. Smith uh, has a comment. Yeah, I think just, you know, as we look at the cirrhotic patients and liver disease um, and how our tests are done, it's just we have to kind of figure out how to put it all together and how we teach people the problems with um, some of the testing. Um, just another comment is, is that this cytokine storm that occurs when the liver becomes unclamped is something that the um, anesthesiologists really fear and uh, there are patients who have totally normal testing who sometimes develop severe cardiac uh, problems in the operating room that can last for 15 to 30 minutes. Um, and just another comment is we often get asked about patent foramen of valleys uh, and the data in the, in the liver, liver uh, transplant literature is that they do not need to be closed. Um, and just a final comment for those who are interested in looking at more risk predictors, all of these patients who undergo liver transplant end up getting abdominal MRIs. And um, I know that uh, there, there has been some interest in looking at if you do not see atherosclerosis on an abdominal MRI on the, on the vasculature, um, does that have any benefit in predicting cardiac risk? And I, I don't think we know the answer to that, but I think it's a it's an area that if somebody in our group had an interest in, in pursuing, it would be an interesting area to, to look at. Um, so uh, those were just, um, just, just my comments about the, the liver patients. Great. And I would agree. Um, you know, I, I think those, you know, the things that we're already getting and how we can use those, I know there's a nice paper that's going to be coming out um, soon in liver transplantation of, of doing, um, it's, it's from Europe. So a much, they do, you know, routine, you know, lung cancer screening with CTs and all their patients. And then of course they're retrospectively going back and, and looking at CAC scoring on standard CTs and without any gating um, and whether or not, you know, absence of, of any, you know, atherosclerosis, um, you know, CAC, a negative CAC score um, potentially can, you know, reduce the need for any further testing or invasive procedures. So again, all, all these studies are limited by the retrospective nature, but I think um, growing back of evidence that we need to be doing a little bit less, not necessarily more um, in certain subpopulations. You know, I have another um, thought also is that as a preventive cardiologist, you know, I just wonder whether a, a lot of people who are coming to see GI for sort of heartburn, acid reflux, what have you, and, uh, you know, for whatever reason, if they have mildly elevated LFTs, and if they're getting liver scans, and if you see fatty liver, wouldn't it be nice to have sort of nice referral patterns where, you know, all of a sudden GI will say, okay, that's fatty liver. They need to have cardiac risk assessment. Let's send them to uh, an internist or a preventive person. Um, have you worked in any of that or? Yeah, Pooja, that's an awesome question. And that is my other passion and sort of the other side of my life um, on the non-transplant side is obviously the work in, in cardiac risk in, in our um, metabolic clinic. So we are, we are, and then we and others, I mean, I know there's others because um, across the country who are working on these pathways and, and, and leveraging, you know, like you said, you know, the EMR. Um, this, um, I know one of our um, huge QI projects at Northwestern has been actually reporting out the incidental finding of hepatic steatosis, which often is not considered an incidental finding. So doing the same 
same thing we do with lung nodules and everything else where it's actually being reported out both in the ER and for scans that are done for other reasons that the primary care doctor is gonna get an alert that um, hepatic stasis was found. It will then link um, to um, an order set that will then allow them to um, both, there's some risk stratification tools that we can use, a FIB4 score um, based on routine labs, and then um, they can have direct access to non-invasive fiber scan, transient elastography imaging to help assess their risk of more severe liver disease, which will then prompt either a pathway towards a hepatology referral, um, and then there's a prompt um, towards a, um, a nutrition intervention um, online class uh, profile through our obesity medicine clinic, and then also back to the primary to consider, like you said, referral to preventive cardiology, lipidology, whoever, you know, in order to aggressively reduce cardiac risk and then repeat risk assessment in three to five years to see what has actually happened uh, with their hepatic steatosis. Yeah, I think that's a really key point, right? The repeat in three to five years to see what happened. Um, that's, that's really, really nice. Um, Okay, any other comments or questions? Um, I'm seeing that we're past 8.30. Uh, so, uh, thank you so much. Sorry for keeping you extra, um, but I really appreciate uh, you presenting. And again, thank you for presenting twice <laughs> at Emory. Um, if well, there's no so other um, comments or questions, uh, we'll close and I will see everyone next week. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.